Since that time, we've had monthly or at least monthly meetings where we have presented various different kinds of, of health care issues from the perspective of different health care disciplines. So we've covered approximately 150 events, so this is one more in that series, in that tradition where we're trying to, to bring practitioners of different disciplines to the same table at the same time to give us a better idea of how we can work together. We have the idea that there's enough disease to go around, but there aren't enough solutions. That's one of the ways that we could perhaps find an easier way to do it. Now, I'm curious to know how many of you found out about this through a friend? How many from KEST Radio? And how many of you have not been to an event here before? Okay, so I'll tell you a little bit about what health medicine is then. The whole idea, as I told you, of what Health Medicine Forum is about was to try and bring a new model of health care to America. And it's built on the idea of collaboration, where we do integrative practice, but it's also built on looking at the whole person. So the concept of looking at body, mind, and spirit and its inseparable nature has been a cornerstone of what we do. In HMO medicine, we've gotten to a place where we're looking to treat diseases instead of human beings. But we've got to come back to a place where we start looking at how to make the person what we're after and not treating the laboratory data or some other kind of extraneous factor. And it's going to be one of the highlights of this presentation tonight that what we're doing is looking at how to treat people. Thirdly, we try to, pe we try to help people to find the discipline or disciplines that are most appropriate for them. So we try to do what's called patient-centered care. I can't do anything right, he says. That's my brother. <laughs> I think mom liked me better anyway. <laughs> and she's back there too, we'll ask her. <laughs> so patient-centered care, and lastly, prevention. So it's a model that's integrative, holistic, person-centered, and preventive. Now, we've taken this model into clinical practice. We designed the model several years, several years ago. We practiced on it at Health Medicine Forum meetings for a couple of years. We brought it into a trial practice where we did about 80 patients where we looked at bringing different disciplines to the same table with a patient at the same time and found that the system really worked. Then we brought it into what's called the Health Medicine Institute, which is now a practice where I'm the medical director at Lafayette where we have 16 practitioners who do this all day long. It's been exciting to be part of this project because now I go to work in the morning literally early, excited about going to work. Because I know what's going to happen there is I'm going to have a chance to be supported by a lot of different kinds of practitioners through the day. So for example, I might have someone who comes in with back pain who's been a, a problem for 20 years or, or longer. So you really do think you want to take this to another level. <laughs> you should give the talk too. It's enough playing tennis with me. Am I making you nervous? <laughs> Sibling rivalry never quits, does it? You can do the sound now. <laughs> All right, try that. There. I hope this fails again, because that was too much fun. <laughs> All right, so we're actually in practice doing this kind of thing where we can have support from other disciplines. So for example, he's getting even with me, isn't he? <laughs> so for example, the patient that comes in with back pain, I may want some support from a body worker, or from an acupuncturist, or somebody who does guided imagery or psychology, or chiropractic. And all day long, there's a wonderful opportunity to share the problems that come up with that particular person with somebody right on the spot. So there are little conferences all the time. So I'm just excited about it and I'm telling you about having this thing come to, to reality for me has been a dream come true. And I hope that this model will be stolen by every healthcare practitioner in America so we can see this thing begin to replace what we've got now, which is a pretty damaged situation. There's too much independence isolated care that becomes adversarial and competitive. We need to work together to try and support the people who are part of our community. Now, tonight's event on thyroid power. Dr. Richard Seamus is, uh, is a longtime friend of mine, actually, and I'll tell you a little story about him. It, was, it must have been about 10 or 12 years ago 
when I visited my good friend Marty Rossman out in Mill Valley because I wanted to learn something about alternative medicine and something to do about nutrition because I was a pretty straightforward internist who thought that was the answer to everything. But I had been around Marty for a while and he was trying to tell me there were other things to do besides just medicine and surgery. And because I knew him well enough and trusted him, I went out there. When I did, he said, I want you to meet my partner, Richard Seamus. And Richard said, I hear you want to learn a little something about nutrition. So he takes me aside out of his busy schedule. He takes me to his files and he starts going through them one at a time. And finally, after about an hour, he leaves me with this stack of stuff. Like things like, what is glucosamine? What is DMSO? These are the different vitamins. And after about 12 or 15 years, I'm starting to get the knack that that's how real health care is practiced, in using some of the natural things first and looking to the more aggressive things last. So I have a deep, heartfelt connection with Richard for taking the time to share to another colleague who had an interest. Now, Richard now is practicing in San Rafael at the Preventive Medicine Clinic. Uh, and there what he's doing is a lot of holistic things that are natural, uh, he knows medicine very well. He's written a book called Thyroid Power, uh, and he'll be telling us a lot about what that book is about because you're all here wanting to know, well, when do we use thyroid? When don't we? Do we have to do the testing? Uh, are, there other, uh, are there times when you use thyroid when your doctor tells you maybe it's not the right thing to do because your tests are normal? How do you get thyroid disease? Uh, what are the effects of toxic elements in the community that, that give us the autoimmune nature of that disease? His background, however, is that he's uh, an adjunct professor at UC Medical Center in San Francisco. So he's a teacher. He's worked for the National Institute of Health and Research. Uh, he's also one of the founding fathers of the American Holistic Medical Association. And uh, he's my friend. We haven't had a presentation like this before, but I have great confidence in his ability to present. I've heard him before. So he's going to be doing this event himself with his partner who he's going to introduce to you. So at this point, Richard, thank you very much for agreeing to do this, and thanks for coming. It's wonderful to be here. Oh, this is great. And I urge you to, to go to Lafayette to see the Holistic Center. Lynn, what do you call it? What do you, uh, it's, it's not called the Holistic Center. You call it? It's the Health Medicine Institute. The Health Medicine Institute. Okay. We do education, research, and clinical practice. And clinical practice. OK. Now, go and take a look at it. This is a new paradigm in healthcare. This is what it, medicine, this is what healthcare and medicine should be. And thank you, thank you for, uh, for coming here. This is a, a wonderful turnout. There's a, there's a great story about, uh, about turnouts. Lynn, you would appreciate this. When I first started in Mill Valley with Marty Rossman, I mean, this was years and years ago, back in the early 70s, I got a telephone call from a fellow from the Organic Farm and Garden Center of Santa Rosa. I'm in Mill Valley, and he's up in uh, Santa Rosa, and he says, will you come up and give a talk about this new uh, paradigm in healthcare? And I said, oh, I don't know. It's, it's way up in Santa Rosa. In those days, it was way up in Santa Rosa. I said, uh, well, how big a crowd are you? He says, doctor, sometimes we get quite a crowd. And he repeated it, quite a crowd. So I said, OK. And then a month later, I'm driving up to Santa Rosa. I notice that traffic is thicker than usual. And I turn off on Highway 12. To, it's going to be at the, uh, the Civic Auditorium, right? And I turn off, and now it's very thick traffic. And I get closer, and there's searchlights going round and round and round. And then there's policemen, you know, and the whole area is uh, being trafficked. In. And I get up to the parking lot, which is it, it, full. I'm the last car, and it's like full. I said, no, no, you don't understand. All these people, they're here to see me. And the guy <laughs> he laughed. He said, that's the best thing I heard all day. You go in. <laughs> it was a wrestling match. It was a big wrestling match. <laughs> But in one of the small rooms, in one of the small rooms off to the side of the Civic Auditorium, the Santa Rosa Organic Farm and Garden Center had its meeting. And we had uh, eight people, and it was, it was quite a crowd. We had a, we had a great time. <laughs> so thank all of you wrestlers for being here tonight. We're going we're to show you something. I'm here as a medical doctor. And I'll tell you a little bit about myself, and I want to tell you about my partner. I'm here 
partly because of what uh, the kind words that Lynn uh, mentioned to you, but also because the shortly um, before or after Lynn came uh, to see Marty Rossman, uh, those years and years ago, I fell in love with one of the nurses that had come to the Holistic Health Center to, to give us the female side of things. And I didn't know it, but she had Hashimoto's thyroiditis. And at the time, I didn't know what that was. And I said, go to an endocrinologist. And the endocrinologist uh, uh, said, put her on Synthroid and said, that's it. And then she was about 50% of her true self. She'd been like down at the 0%. Anyway, she's now 50% of her true self, and our former self. And the endocrinologist, uh, when we asked him uh, on a subsequent appointment why she wasn't doing better, he said, this is as good as it gets. <laughs> And so I had, we were married and we were gonna have children, this is as good as it gets, and I was, okay. So she, we went to the UC Med Center, and the doc there said, no, no, this isn't as good as it gets. You haven't tried uh, Cytomel, you haven't, there's a few things, a higher doses, you have the few things you haven't tried. Carolee tried one or two of those, and now she's like at 85%. So the local endocrinology specialist was not giving thyroid the full, attention or brain power or something that the university specialist endocrinologist was able to give. So I, I started doing that in my practice. What's that? It's easy. Oh, T, add T3 to T4. That's easy. I, and lots of people started doing better. So then I started seeing more thyroid patients. And then some of those nutritional things that uh, uh, Lenz Buddha was talking about I found were effective for thyroid. In fact, they were very effective for thyroid. Some of the maneuvers were more effective for thyroid than they were for arthritis. So I got more, and so now Carly's doing like 95% of her true self. And it's, so it's, got, it's gotten better and better. And this is why I'm here, to tell other people about the success that Carly and I have had. Now, one of my successes was one day I'm in my office and uh, Lynn Saputo had, had just left, and then in walked, Alex Foreman. And Alex said, oh, I hear about, you know, some of what you're uh, doing. I'm, I've been at the UC Med Center San Francisco. I want to get out of the university into a, a, another setting here. What do you do here? And I, and I heard a, a little bit about his story and I said, I grabbed him by the tie, sat him down <laughs> and said, you're my man. <laughs> you're gonna, we need you here because we didn't have a research component. Alex has been Come on and, and talk about this. Uh, Alex has been uh, with the UC Med Center doing a variety of uh, clinical research uh, projects. Started off at San Francisco General Hospital. And now we practice together in San Rafael. And it's an amazing, it's an amazing <coughs> practice. It's a holistic approach to thyroid and other chronic illnesses. So I'm, I'm gonna show you some slides about it and so forth, but uh, Alex uh, will, will tell us a little bit about himself. Well, I um, actually was involved in helping to start the first alternative therapies clinic that was ever set up in a county hospital. It was set up in San Francisco General back in 1977 called the Alternative Therapies Unit. So I've been doing alternatively oriented healthcare for more than 25 years now. And I didn't really know a whole lot about this whole thyroid stuff when I met Richard. And he started telling me, well, we do a lot of thyroid here and we give a lot of thyroid out. And I said, well, how much good could that do? And so I, this was maybe six, seven years ago, and I started working with him, and I watched an endless parade of people come in who had been, either been to a doctor, they were, they were complaining they were tired, they were cold, uh, they were gaining weight, their, their minds were foggy, they just didn't feel themselves, and they'd had their thyroid tested and it was normal, and they were told, it must be all in your mind. And yet these people had this sense that it was their thyroid. They'd read a book, they had a sense it was. They'd come in, we looked at the tests, well, they were sort of normal, but a little on the low end. We gave them thyroid, and then lo and behold, they'd come back a month later and they'd say, I am so much better, I feel completely different. And I'm thinking, okay, placebo response, this can't be real. And then month after month, these people would come back and they'd still feel better. And it suddenly dawned on me that medicine, the way you're taught it, it has a way of, of straightjacketing everything. And so you're either hypothyroid if you have a TSH above 5.5, and if you don't, you're not. And it's that simple, and that's the way you practice. And if, if your TSH is 4.8, you're not hypothyroid, you're depressed, and you should go on Prozac. Um, I've seen countless people who were put through that route. 
And then we real, you know, I realized that these ranges and these norms are a complete kind of blinder that's put on people that are stuck in the conventional medicine box. And I think between Richard and myself, we've probably helped maybe a thousand people or more feel better who had quote, normal thyroid tests. And he came up with this concept, the tyranny of the test. And I think it's really valid. A test is only one guidepost. If somebody comes in, I just had four patients come several hundred miles to see us because the doctor in their local town up in the foothills of the Sierras wouldn't give them more thyroid, even though they said they felt 100% better on the higher dose. He said, no, it's too dangerous, I won't give it to you. And he cut them off. And they came like begging to our office, will you give us thyroid? And like I said, sure. He said, you will? Oh, you know, it was like I was some savior or something. All I was doing was saying, well, why wouldn't I give you something that made you feel better? Why am I doing this? And they were, they were like so refreshed to hear that. And we put them back on higher doses and they are, they're like 100% better than they were. And they literally came into that office exhausted, unable to function, unable to work. And that happens countless times. So I think the message and the, the whole thrust of what Richard Shamas discovered is, is uh, helped discover is really true. That there are probably millions and millions of people undiagnosed who actually benefit from some amount of thyroid hormone and that there's literally no downside to it. And um, I've had patients as young as 11 or 12 years old brought in by their parents who were just about flunking out of school, had had tests, they were normal, put them on thyroid and suddenly they're getting A's. And that's hard to pull off in like a teenage um, girl, for example, who is not studying at all. And just by that one intervention, she's now getting A's. And we've had people as old as in their 80s who were depressed and lethargic and thyroid helped them. So I think it's not the universal panacea for everything nothing is, not everyone benefits, but it certainly taught me that a lot of us can really feel better on this. And so when he moved to Florida, we moved the practice up to the Preventive Medical Center and we've been going very well there. And uh, that's why I'm here to help answer any questions or spread the word about this. Um, whether you come to us or not, I think it's important if you know somebody or you're not feeling well to have this angle at least checked out by someone who believes in it because it does make a difference. Good, thank you, Alex. Alex has been involved in a research at uh, the major university medical center and has been now combing the, the field, the, the thyroid research, so he knows from what he speaks. What we're trying to let you folks uh, hear about uh, right today, tonight, is that it's not just Carolee, or it's not just a few people that Alex and I are seeing. We, in this country, are in the midst of an epidemic. It's a hidden epidemic. Thyroid problems were first, I, by me, thought, I, I thought, Alex had thought, and I don't know about Lynn Saputo, but we, generally doctors think that it's, it's, it's not very many people that have them, and if you do have it, it's a, it's a minor problem, okay? But the recent research is from what Alex has been informing me. The recent research is showing that thyroid problems are incredibly common. They're much more common than was previously thought. And they're becoming more and more common. In addition to that, they cause more severe illness than was ever realized. So it's not just fatigue, depression, overweight, dry skin, dry hair, dry eyes, uh, the, the problems with digestion, the, the, the problems with low libido, uh, the uh, high cholesterol. The, it turns out some very severe illnesses occur in people because they are also low thyroid and are genetically prone to that illness. Thyroid is the gas pedal for everything else. That's what I found out when I started looking into it. Why is this, why is this one little gland cause all these other the symptoms? How could one problem uh, in this part of your body cause everything in all these other parts? It sounds like we are saying it's a panacea for everything, but I, it's not. It's just that many more people have it than most doctors admit. And because it's the gas pedal 
because it's the throttle for all the other organs, for every other chemical reaction in the body. You can have anything, anywhere, being made worse by a thyroid problem. If not actually caused by the thyroid, it's just being made worse. The doctors at the Columbia Presbyterian Medical Center in New York estimate that 20 million people, 20 million Americans, are already under treatment for a thyroid problem. This number dwarfs most of the other illnesses in this country, okay? And these are the people that have been diagnosed by the standard tests and are under treatment. You ask any pharmacist, what's the category of medicines uh, that you write the most prescriptions for? You know, is it lipid medicines? Uh, is it blood pressure medicines? Uh, depress antidepressant medicines? And the pharmacist will say, well, well yeah, all that, I, I mean, do a lot of that, but uh, you know, most of the prescriptions I write are for thyroid. Just ask, you know, and, and, and see what, okay. Or just how it compares to these other very common illnesses. 20 million people have it. Now, one of the Harvard uh, thyroid doctors did a survey, he said, I wonder how common this is in the population. What about the people that don't get that test? So he went out to Colorado, became head of the department out there, the University of Colorado Health Sciences Center. And Chester Ridgway did this unusual maneuver. Usually medical studies are done, uh, Alex, you mentioned one study that had how many people? Six. <laughs> a lot of what you hear is medical, what, a medical gospel. Yeah, a lot of stuff that becomes medical gospel, if you, I, I love to do this, is to go back and trace the original study that made this the word of God. And sometimes you'll find a study with six people um, that led to this incredible dogma that this is absolutely true. And when, if you actually trace some of this back, it's, some of it's pretty flimsy evidence. And a, a lot of things that standard medical practitioners do is because it appears in a textbook once, and then every other textbook after that, but then you find that you kind of like the emperor has no clothes. It's really not necessarily true at all. And thyroid is one of the things that falls into that category. Because a lot of the work on thyroid was done a really long time ago, and no one bothered following it up. Well, what about people whose TSH isn't above five, but it's between three and five? Are they, do they feel any different than the people whose TSH is maybe below one? No one's ever looked at that, but I can tell you from the practice that it's clearly true that you know, there's nothing written on that. No one's even looked at it because it was, the dogma was that if you're above this number, you have hypothyroid, and if you're below it, you don't. And it's that simple. For everyone, I'd say 98% of the people practicing this country, that's the way it is. Right, so Chester Ridgway, this Harvard professor, uh, was the dogma was that maybe one out of a hundred people might have had thyroid, okay? Well, and, and so that's like, that's a significant number of people with an illness in this country. But he said, well, let's try it out. He went and gave the standard test, the standard test that people get for diagnosed low thyroid, uh, he gave it to anyone who showed up at a health fair. Now, maybe that's a skewed population. These are people, maybe everybody with thyroid problems will go to a health fair, right? <laughs> but uh, maybe not. People with all sorts of problems or people who are just healthy go to health fairs. So he did health fairs all over Colorado. And as many people as he could, he gave this TSH test to. And it was a prodigious feat because instead of six in this study, he had 26,500 people. Who, and this, uh, this had never been done before. And they found out, and this was incredible, they found out one out of 10 people had some form of low thyroid. One out of 10. That was, look around you, I, you know, I, it, that's a, that's a, that was a lot of people just at, just at random. And what was interesting is he asked these people ahead of time, do you have any, any medical problems that you know of? No, the only people he tested were the people who weren't on thyroid, weren't on, you know, okay, this, okay. So now, in addition to the 20 million people that are on medicine, he estimated, so he calculated all of this out and the, the number of people in Colorado, the number of people in the country and so forth. He calculated that there's another 15 million people that would have some form of thyroid if they only got the test. And then Alex is telling you that the tests are lousy. <laughs> There are many people that would have the test and be told that they're normal, but they really still have the problem. So this is a major epidemic. So when I was trying to find out, how many people have seen uh, this volume a few years ago called Our Stolen Future? Our Stolen Future was uh, uh, the environmental pollution problem that's plaguing the, the planet right now, but, but largely in this, in this country, they studied. 
And it, it, these folks did a massive amount of uh, scouring the uh, health literature and found out that the, the pollution in the air, food, and water that was coming down to haunt us, that everyone, you worried about cancer or something, okay, the pollution in the air, food, and water, the major target of this is the endocrine glands, the major disruption. And of that, the major player is the thyroid. Thyroid gland, okay, <laughs> right. And that is what I want to tell you about tonight. We have this epidemic, and most doctors were in my position, were in Alex's position. Before, before we, we got into this, we had no idea how much suffering there was, how widespread it was. Women are the major victims of this. Eight out of 10 thyroid sufferers is a woman. And the problems that women have can be uh, very special, okay? You can get triggered into thyroid at puberty, child, right after childbirth, or at menopause. Thyroid problems, when they're triggered, can cause everything from irregular periods to very bad PMS, endometriosis, ovarian cysts, infertility, recurrent miscarriage, and awful menopause, okay? Terrible, terrible menopause. For which often women are given estrogen. But the problem is, in this case, estrogen makes thyroid work less well. So now you're already a little bit low thyroid, you get estrogen, your thyroid goes down worse, you're gaining weight, you're feeling worse, you might have less hot flashes, but things are just not going so well. That's why we came up with this program. All right, so. This is the name of the book. The, uh, the idea is that you can improve on this situation. This is not uh, such a, a, a difficult situation. There's a silver lining here. What the silver lining is, thyroid is something that is generally much easier to treat than these other illnesses that are much more severe and, and, and much more terrible. Be better to have thyroid than chronic fatigue syndrome. Be better to have thyroid than a severe rheumatoid arthritis. Be better to have thyroid than the cancer, of course. It'd be better to have thyroid than heart disease. Okay, and, and thyroid mimics those other conditions, symptoms of those other conditions. So, what can you do? This is the whole essence of the Health Medicine Forum and the Health Medicine Institute is personal empowerment, patient empowerment. You can do something about this, even if your doctors aren't. Okay, so what can you do? First of all, to know that this is a, a condition that is problematic. Without warning, a great many of us are going to be suddenly struck by this thyroid thing. It can occur any time. It, it's a genetic situation that is exacerbated by environmental pollution and then can be triggered by a variety of events. I mentioned uh, puberty, childbirth, menopause. You can have it triggered by an accident, like a whiplash, an illness, like pneumonia, an operation, some kind of surgery, or any bereavement, or, you know, I, I don't know if a marital argument would trigger it, but uh, some women say it does. Now, if, if you know about it, you can be prepared and do something about it. So, what are some of these steps, if these are, you have these 10 steps? Thyroid epidemic is a hidden epidemic. Most people don't know that it's an epidemic or that they may have it. The first step is to realize that you might have it, or it, couldn't be, it might be a hidden factor in your overall health. We've told you some of the symptoms. You have a handout with some of the other symptoms. Does everyone have that handout? Okay, you, you get, if it's not it's on this table here by the poster over on my right, there are more of the handouts where some of the major cardinal symptoms are listed. It turns out all symptoms of thyroid, uh, all lists of thyroid symptoms are just partial because there's a great many. I was asked just now, just now, whether sudden onset of cataracts might be related to sudden onset of low thyroid. Uh, the answer is yes. 
that's not on the list. It's not on the list in textbooks, but I have seen it, and this particular uh, lady had it. Okay. Uh, um, other epidemics. There was a great epidemic in uh, ancient Rome where people had a bizarre behavior, like a dementia, acting pleasantly crazy, <laughs> but also had severe gastrointestinal symptoms. The Emperor Nero was supposed to have fiddled while Rome burned. And uh, that uh, legend is probably not true, but it, it, it grew up because a great many Romans were doing the silly things like that. And it was an epidemic. And Roman doctors, who were very astute about uh, science of their day with herbs and salves and, and, and things, uh, didn't attribute this to the gods. They knew that there was some problem. But they didn't know what it was. And you know when the problem was finally figured out? Last year! <laughs> Not too long ago. It was figured out not too long ago. Uh, because they were doing some excavations in Rome and they had to remove some of the, the catacombs underneath the city and the bones of people that were alive at that time. And they did some uh, lead, uh, they did uh, mineral analysis on the bones and found out an inordinate high amount of lead poisoning in these bones. And there wasn't lead around in other places. The, 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 the lead was in the bones. And lead poisoning has some very characteristic symptoms. Dementia, gastrointestinal distress being the main ones. The Romans lined their aqueducts with lead. They used lead cooking pots. They had lead in all forms of uh, the construction uh, inside and outside of the houses and everywhere, okay? And they used lead in ways that we, we don't do it now. Uh, up until very recently, though, houses were painted with lead and inside and outside, and kids would eat the lead and get the, the same problem. All right, so we were not immune to this epidemic either. But if you wait until all the answers are in about just why and how there is this thyroid epidemic, until you get to this, all the medical doctors have total surety about just what it is, and you might be waiting a long time. Hopefully, you won't have to wait 2,000 years, but there's, there's something you can do about it. The uh, illness is actually autoimmune illness. Low thyroid, and high thyroid too, by the way, is autoimmune. What does that mean? That means it's the immune system that's gone awry and it's attacking the thyroid gland, okay? That's bizarre, but it happens. And if only one or two people had it, they would be at the NIH being studied by Alex Foreman, you know, and given research, but it's, it's like millions of people that this is happening to. The autoimmune illnesses, are growing exponentially and are showing up in extraordinary clusters around communities tainted with toxic chemicals. But there are toxic chemicals everywhere and just small amounts are enough to sensitize a person who's genetically prone to, to this condition. Okay, so it masquerades as other illnesses. We already talked about that. Here is a cartoon about how thyroid becomes a problem. It can make any other illness worse. If you have low thyroid, you might be dealing with a number of other things. The doctor may say it's this depression and relieve your depression with antidepressant, but you are still dealing with all of these other problems. And sometimes the thyroid boulder is actually the biggest one. And you can be relieved of some of these others, but you're still dragging the thyroid boulder. It makes anything else worse. And sometimes it actually masquerades as, as other things. So the step for that we call step two. A lot of people with fatigue have thyroid problems. The, the guru of uh, chronic fatigue syndrome and fibromyalgia, uh, Jacob Teitelbaum, showed up at one of my uh, thyroid seminars for doctors. And I said, what, what are you doing here? You're the last person, you know, he already knew about thyroid. He said, no, nah, none of us know enough about it. We all need to learn more, patients and doctors included. So this was one of the gurus who was now trying to get a refresh report. They're about thyroid causing low energy. That's one of its cardinal uh, uh, problems. And all of these other conditions. But that's just to name a few. If you treat the thyroid problem, these other conditions have a better chance of getting better. 
How do you treat it? Well, first you have to know about it. This is the current problem that Alex Foreman was telling you about. Alex has been a researcher at a major medical center for 15 years. And he's telling you that this is uh, one of the things that's happening. Doctors are getting fairly narrow, especially with managed care. They're narrow in their focus. The idea in the old days was that if you looked at lab tests, symptoms, family history, associated illnesses, basal temperature, hit the ankle and looked at the reflex, all of that, you had a pretty good chance of coming up with an overall uh, gestalt about a person and that they were low thyroid. You make a diagnosis based on your impression as a clinician, okay, as a practitioner that took into account many factors, including lab tests, which were not that ac which were known to be not that accurate. Nowadays, it's done the way it is up on top, with just one pillar trying to hold up the whole roof, and it, it, it's really pretty lopsided. So we'll have, we'll have uh, questions. Uh, I'm going to be uh, running through these steps, and then we'll have questions of a general nature, and then a little intermission, and then we'll have any of you, after that, we'll have a whole longer question and answer period for any of you that have very specific questions about your own thyroid situation or someone that, uh, that you know or one of your loved ones. So we'd be glad to answer it. Either. Alex and I will, will answer. Okay, so the, the step related to that uh, temple of diagnosis is as follows. You've got to use all of this to make a diagnosis, okay? You recognize low thyroid, sometimes by the symptoms, so by what person will tell you what they're going through, but also uh, related conditions. If someone has carpal tunnel syndrome or mitral valve prolapse or endometriosis, right, right away, that's, a, that's like a, you know, a red flag that comes up, okay? And that's for me, now that I know about thyroid. Before I, I, I did, that was just another condition. Oh, that's part of your medical history. You're supposed to write it down. So you write down that's part of the medical history. It stays on the chart. Nothing has happened to it. But now when I see that, as well, or, or as well as a variety of other things that you'll see in the book, these are related conditions, and they are red flags for low thyroid. Uh, the family history. Major. How many of you have anyone in your family that's ever had a thyroid problem? Okay. Well, that, if you don't have a thyroid problem, and you're here because a family member, I just want you to know, Someone in your family having a thyroid problem means that you are very likely to have it, okay? You're more likely to have a thyroid problem if someone in your family has thyroid than you are to have diabetes if someone in your family had diabetes. Now, those of you that uh, didn't know about this, that diabetes is very inherited. If anyone in your family's had diabetes, you want to be on the, you know, you're really checking your blood sugars and, you know, doing uh, your urines and all that. Well, you're more, the thyroid is just more inherited than that. The physical signs. Who has eyebrows that don't, that don't go quite as far out as they used to go, okay? Have you ever had a doctor hit your uh, knee or your ankle and say, oh, that's funny, it doesn't seem to bounce as much as it uh, used to, uh, okay. The, these are, again, signs, not symptoms, but signs of low thyroid. There's a list of them in, in the book. Then assessment, doctors do assessments the, the old way, the old assessment was, <laughs> Alex, uh, the assessment is you look at the TSH. If it's, if it's within this range, you know, it, it, okay. uh, that leads to this next step. Here, let me show you this. This is the funny one. Here is the assessment these days. except that because of this kind of scenario that's repeated over and over again without the chart on the wall quite like that, okay. But it's repeated over and over again countless times in every medical clinic. I used to do it, Alex used to do it, now we're doing it differently. The researchers are saying this has to be changed, but medicine is like this slow lumbering giant that uh, has been, okay, the way to San Jose, the way to San Jose, and, the, and then someone says, no, no, you want to go to Menlo Park. Oh. No, the way to San Jose. Okay. 
you know, do you, do you want to watch the ball game? Who goes to Candlestick Park to watch the ball game? Anymore, right? <laughs> All right. This is what this is what is extremely common, and it's not as funny when it happens to the to you. You know, are, are the millions of people that are suffering needlessly? Okay. So what can be done about that? Oh, okay, here we go. There you go. You can still be low thyroid despite normal tests. Let me tell you a little story about that. When I was in my internship, the Public Health Service Hospital San Francisco, I was in charge of the Coast Guard the Coast Guard in the all Bay Area, they would come to uh, me and my colleagues and we would see if they were fit for duty or not fit for duty, okay? There was one young Coast Guardsman, she could, you remember this story, there was one young Coast Guardsman who, the story was, he had been all around Alameda, going around through the garbage cans, through the waste baskets in the, the provost's office, everywhere he could on all the tables like this, going around looking at stuff, picking something up and saying, this ain't it, putting it down and trying something else. In the garbage, they open it. This ain't it. This ain't it. This ain't it. This ain't it. And, do, and driving everyone nuts. So they bring him to see me. <laughs> he goes through every paper in my office saying this ain't it. And I say, oh man, this guy's crazy. So I pull out the, the, you know, the, the medical discharge form, stamp it, say, take this to the sergeant. He opens it up, reads it, and says, this is it. This is it. Medical discharge. <laughs> I tell you that story for a very particular purpose, okay? If there's nothing else that you take home from tonight's talk, it's this, okay? This is it. You can still be low thyroid with normal tests. There's a lot about that, but that, uh, this, uh, suffice that for right now. What are these tests? Want to take a look at a few? People have had this, okay? A lot of people have had these tests. You can tell thyroid tests on your uh, lab sheet by the word T in front of something. It's a T this and a T that, and okay, so that's thyroid. And it turns out thyroid tests are not nearly as accurate as other medical tests. If you've had a cholesterol test, that's more accurate. If you had a blood count, that's more accurate. If you had uh, the sodium and potassium, that's more accurate. Any of your chemistry is much more accurate than thyroid tests. But they're printed on the same kind of paper with the same ink. And it looks like they could be accurate too, but they're not as accurate. The reason they're not as accurate is they have a high percentage of false negatives. Meaning the test is negative normal. But you're suffering, like that lady with her tongue out, right? You're, okay, you're suffering. And they, the one good thing about them is they don't have very many false positives. A false positive is the test shows, oh, the test shows you have rheumatoid arthritis and you say, oh, no. Well, that test has some false positives. You may not have rheumatoid arthritis. Or prostate, you know, the PSA is high. You might have prostate cancer. No, that test has a lot of false positives. These tests don't. So if you, say, if you do show up with a thyroid problem, you can trust it. If you show up normal, you may not want to trust it. This, I show you uh, this particular one to let you see the very top test. It's called a free T3, and I recommend it to you, okay? And you'll remember this because if it doesn't rhyme, it doesn't chime, okay? <laughs> free T3. None of the other tests rhyme. Free T3. Say it over and over, because that could be one of your better tests. The reason, you, the people are looking at me like I'm crazy, Lynn. I, uh, look. Here's the deal. This test, if you look at uh, all the other tests, there's a whole panel of thyroid tests, including thyroid antibodies, including the best tests that people get at Kaiser and the UC Med Center and, and Stanford. And they're all normal. And this is a, the, the TSH, although it's not listed up there, was normal three different times on three separate tests. This person was tested normal and the endocrinologist swore, you don't have a thyroid problem. The person was suffering, had the cardinal symptoms, had some of the signs, and if you look up, they went to Alex and got a free T3. Guess what? Low! Low! 
Guess what? Your tests are not all normal. You've got a very low free T3. That, and what is that? That's a test that's usually not done. Guess what it is? What's the total amount of active thyroid hormone in your bloodstream that's available to go to work for you? That's not done. Uh, I'll re <laughs> Someone says, that's not done? <laughs> that's, that's right. <laughs> That's right, it's the height of absurdity, okay? You would think that the one thing you would want to know when you get all these expensive blood tests is what is the total amount of active thyroid hormone? Now that's a key word, because not storage thyroid hormone, not bound up thyroid hormone, but active thyroid hormone that's free and ready to go to work for you. The answer is the free T3 will tell you that, and it's available, it's a newer test, and it, it's done at the, guess where it's done? It's done at the university medical centers. It's done at the NIH. You can get it here, it's done by Quest Labs, Smith Klein, you can get it, but you have to ask for it. Oh. Okay, so that, but it, the, the problem with these thyroid tests is that it's, this is not the, it's always the one that's positive in every case. Sometimes it's a different one that's positive, so it's a little more complex than that, but this is a very good test. Uh, a lot of the tests, I'll show you this to show you that a lot of the tests can be normal, but one of them may not be, and if one of them isn't, then you, you do it. You see, it's not, the, it's not the overwhelming weight of the evidence, but instead, uh, as Thoreau used to say, here, the, Henry David Thoreau figured this out. Here, Henry David Thoreau was not a thyroid specialist, <laughs> but he had the following saying about farmers who water down the milk in Massachusetts countryside and sell it make more money by selling watered down milk. And Henry David Thoreau said, all you need to do is find a little trout in the milk one time to know that the, all the milk is liable to be watered down, okay? You just need to find a little baby trout in the milk one time. If any of these tests are abnormal, something's liable to be abnormal, okay? It doesn't have to be the preponderance of the evidence. You're going to say, oh, most of your tests, well, you have normal thyroid. Most of the tests were normal. Don't stand for that, all right? Here's one. The, all the tests are normal. All those tests are normal, but the one that's abnormal is your thyroid antibodies. Those are available, but those are hardly ever done either. But since thyroid is an immune system illness, you can get that test. And if it's abnormal and you have these symptoms, no matter what the other tests show, get some treatment for it. Okay. Now, let's talk about treatment. Here is treatment in this country. Okay. Everybody gets Synthroid, maybe about 100. Okay, 100, 125, 112 is centroid. That's what everybody gets. Right. Who's on thyroid here? Okay. Were you originally put on centroid around 100, 125? Right, okay. <laughs> Many of you are, right, okay. It turns out, and those of you that weren't, you're lucky, see, because that's very much the norm. And it's one size fits all, and it's not true. It's just as untrue as, the, as this. So what can you do? Here is uh, what we talk about in our book as far as... You get to discover what's the best medicine for you by trying a few different ones. You get to discover what's the best dose by trying a, a several different doses. Start gently. Uh, there are many approaches as far as the brands. Synthroid is just one brand. There's Levothroid, Levoxyl, uh, Unithroid is the new one. There's generic thyroid that sometimes works better. That most of the people, uh, the, the, the brand name works better. But when those don't work, you add T3 to them because those are all T4. Those are all T4 thyroid hormone, storage thyroid hormone. It is not what is active in the body. When you get Synthroid or Levoxyl, or uh, who's on Synthroid or Levoxyl or Unithroid or uh, the lever throw, okay. Those are not active in your body. Your body has to convert them to T3, which is the active component. And T3 is sometimes not converted from T4 appropriately. So, but you take T3, it's called cytomel. 
add Cytomel to your Synthroid, you have a new combo. Was there any research about that, Alex? Yeah, yeah no. there, there was actually, come on, stand up there. There was actually a study in the New England Journal, the Bible of Medicine, um, back in 1998, I believe, that um, they tested people on straight T4 Synthroid, Voloxel, versus the same people put on Voloxel, Synthroid plus Cytomel, and they found that the majority of people felt better on the mix, T4 and T3, than they did on T4. Not all of them, but a majority of them had improvements in symptoms like fatigue, mental concentration, and focus. And even though that article appeared, it's still very rarely practiced. Still the overwhelming number of people that go for their thyroid gets put on straight T4. And um, my wife, for example, went and had low thyroid and they just put her on Synthroid. And I said, well, why don't, why don't you ask them to give you some Cytomel? And they said, well, the doctor, that's not going to do her any good. And I said, well, just humor us and <laughs> try it. <laughs> <laughs> and so she's definitely doing better on the combination than she was on the, the single. And um, it's, again, a case where medicine doesn't keep up with these things, doesn't the dogma is so strict because Synthroid came in replacing natural thyroid. And natural thyroid is now seen as this antiquated, barbaric way to treat thyroid, when actually a lot of people do better on natural thyroid. A whole lot of people, not everyone. But I've seen people who did terrible on Synthroid, you put them on natural thyroid and everything gets better. And that's because natural thyroid is a natural T3, T4 mix. So it's again, the dogma in medicine became, and I think this became dogma in the late 60s, or early 70s, that Synthroid, Synthroid was discovered. And because it was new, manufactured in a laboratory, reproducible, perfectly scientific and everything, that everyone should get it. Well, recently the FDA found out that Synthroid and Lavoxyl both had incredible dosing problems, that they were mislabeling their doses, that when they examined like a 100 microgram pill of either brand, there actually weren't 100 micrograms in there. And this is exactly what they used to accuse the natural thyroid of. So it's just another example where doctors, medical providers have to be more flexible and take the patient into account and not get stuck with a formula. Listen, that, that uh, was the, the, the whole business of Synthroid is Better was brought to you by the same people that uh, brought us the Bob formula is better than Bresco. Okay? And you know what happened with that? A whole generation uh, didn't get Bresco because formula was better. And it turns out later it was found, oh no, we were wrong. There were things in breast milk that we couldn't measure in those days, but you know, like immunofactors and uh, bonding with the mother. Okay, so it, it's worth keeping uh, your options open. I told you about thyroid being used, uh, well, rather, th thyroid gets triggered by menopause, okay? Thyroid can get triggered by menopause. This cartoon and the book were published, uh, uh, you know, well over a year ago, and it turns out, just in recent months, we found out that estrogen, the, you know, the benefits of estrogen have been overplayed, and the risks were, you know, sort of uh, swept under the rug. A great many menopause problems are low thyroid problems in disguise. And you can treat the thyroid situation in menopause. Is, you don't need estrogen and all this other stuff that's usually used because menopause is not such a, a terrible deal. I don't want to minimize sometimes the difficulties that the menopause will cause. Uh, and thyroid is not always the, the solution for everything, but it is wonderfully helpful. And like I said, when you have menopause being worse because your thyroid is low and you don't know it, and then you take estrogen, that makes your thyroid even lower because Estrogen increases thyroxin binding proteins in the blood so that all of the thyroid that you do have, even though it's less than you ought to, but you, all that you, is now more tightly held in the bloodstream where it's inactive and doesn't do anything. And it doesn't get out as easily into the tissues where it could function. So it's all in the bloodstream and you do a test and the tests look great because it's all in the bloodstream. You're testing in the blood. That's the problem with the blood test. You do a, put a needle here into a vein and then find, try to try to find out what's happening inside the interior of the cells, right? Okay, thyroid works sitting on the DNA, but we don't measure that. 
We measure uh, this is what's happening in the, in the vein. And anybody who's ever had diabetes, they know that what's happening in the, in the vein is not exactly what's happening inside the cells. The cells could be starving for glucose and you have 500 units, you have you know, five times what you should have in your bloodstream. It's just not getting in, okay? It's a little like um, how we used to, I'm from Virginia, used to, uh, how we would measure uh, the weight of a pig at the county fair in Virginia in the old days. The way they do it, if you didn't have a scale, a lot of the fairs, they didn't have a scale. You'd search around until you found a rock, a big rock, that would exactly balance the weight of the pig on a, on a theater top, okay? And then when you found just the right size rock, then you'd guess the weight of the rock. <laughs> We've talked a little bit about this already. Okay, uh, God is in distress for a variety of reasons. The endometriosis, the infertility, uh, the terrible menopause, just bad PMS. You can often help the situation. If anybody in the family of a person who's going through this has ever had a thyroid problem or diabetes, which is also autoimmune, or any other autoimmune illness, uh, rheumatoid arthritis, or any, any of the more uh, rare ones, if thyroid is even least bit in the family, then you have a chance to do some thyroid treatment and, and really help these uh, uh, you know, female problems. But female problems are not the only ones. A great many times, a person will have a thyroid problem and then handle it by treating it. And Lynn, this is uh, the person that you were telling me about uh, tonight that you will introduce me to. You treat the thyroid problem and then it's in the trash can resolved. And the person goes merrily on their way and tell, oops, what about adrenal insufficiency? For many people, adrenal problems coexist with thyroid problems. And treating the thyroid feels better at first, but then it, it, you either can't get enough of it because you have adrenal insufficiency, or you treat it, and, and now you're feeling worse because of adrenal insufficiency. So you give up on the thyroid. Tremendous opportunity has been lost because you really did have a thyroid problem. It was just you had an adrenal problem too, and that uh, made things worse. So how many people here have adrenal problems? Ah, there's a nice show of hands. But I want to tell you, many of you that didn't raise your hand you have an adrenal problem too, because they're very common. They just not, I talked about even less than thyroid. The thyroid adrenal connection is major. Thyroid doesn't work well without adrenal, and adrenal doesn't work well without thyroid. What is the adrenal? It's the gland that allows us to cope with the world. You could get along without your adrenals if you just sat on the couch and ate chips and watched reruns of Friends. <laughs> but doing anything else, you'll need adrenal function. And the testing for adrenal is even worse than the testing for thyroid. We, we can talk a little more about that. Uh, just here's an example. This is called, this is a, a, the Diagnostex uh, version of an adrenal test. I just put it up here to show you briefly. You look at the graph on the upper right. Uh, there's a person, uh, the, the patient is the dark line in the middle, and where they should be is between those lines, okay? Between the other two lines. And uh, they have a, a noon uh, cortisol level that's actually pretty low. And that they're having a tough time uh, right at noon. You end up with the uh, little uh, chart down below, the patient is the, y is the uh, square, the little tiny square, and that's in the wrong box, okay? <laughs> the square should be in the normal box that's shaded, and they're outside of the box. How many people think outside of the box, right? Okay. <laughs> this person is uh, functioning outside of the box, and it's, un it's uncomfortable. They have an, an, an adrenal, you know, an adrenal insufficiency. The, but, so this test, again, there's a lot of false negatives, but if the test shows it, you might have it. Uh, there's a lot about adrenal that we can talk about, but here's the next step. Here's this. Whether it's adrenal or thyroid, if you just 
treat the problem with medications. You might be in a perilous situation when it'd be far better to, to treat the problem with medication, diet, stress reduction, alternative therapies, vitamins, exercise, all the things that are at the Health Medicine Institute in Lafayette. The reason the Institute has all of those things is that it's, to have them all is better than just doing the one. How much better? And what are the details? Alex Foreman has a, uh, for a saying. He's it caused the infants to have goiters. Now they can add some iodine to it, or they can uh, change the ratio and so forth. And uh, so now some soy formulas are okay for kids. But uh, soy is a goitrogen, unless it's really well cooked. Sometimes you can't cook it well enough. There are other foods that are goitrogens. So in my book, we list some of the foods that you may want to avoid. One good one to avoid is NutraSweet. Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> anyway, the number of other nutritional maneuvers, and we can talk, we can talk more about this. Let me just go through the, the rest of these. This is just for the PhDs and professors of endocrinology that are in the audience. I wanted them to know that we, you know, we're not into uh, just the flaky thing here. We've really studied it, all right? <laughs> the brain, the part of the brain called the hypothalamus, secretes a chemical TRH, tells the pituitary, hey, there's not enough thyroid. The pituitary is the man on the job or the lady on the job and says, okay, I'll handle it secretes TSH, thyroid stimulating hormones, stimulates the thyroid to secrete thyroid hormone, which is T4, thyroxin. T4, I told you, is inactive. It has to get converted to T3. Right here, this conversion right here, needs uh, selenium, zinc, vitamin E. The, uh, this is a, an herb called ashwagandha that helps with that. That's uh, withania somnifera. It's, a, it's an herb that you can uh, buy and it might help uh, your conversion of inactive T4 into active T3. Active T3 doesn't do anything until it gets inside the cell. It's not clear just what, uh, how that uh, happens. It's believed that, uh, to be much more complex than it just goes inside the cell. But once it does go inside the cell, it combines, and this is uh, a, what's called a heterodimer. It's two, um, two items that form together and then sit on the DNA. It sits on the DNA. These are some of the nutrients here. I'm sorry. These are some of the nutrients uh, uh, here that allow that uh, function. What the DNA uh, transcription does, this is the book of life. How well the book of life is read is determined by your amount of uh, T3 that's sitting on your DNA. And also, this is your mitochondria. This is the energy inside of you. And how much energy you have to do all the chemical work that you need to do, or the healing that you'd like to do, or to absorb all the vitamins and nutrients that you do, or to benefit from the body work that you do. Anyway, you can see it's a, anyway. Why did I show that slide? Okay. Here is, <laughs> here is, um, The next step is to be careful about your environment, especially the part of it that you're in control over. My mother used to do this. We did this. We would go to, and every, every time we would uh, go to a vacation, we'd be at a motel or something. God forbid there would be dirt or uh, bugs. And she would have her own bottle of, uh, we called it in those days, uh, real kill. How many of you know about real kill? That was, that was, yeah, right. Okay, that's strong stuff. Anyway, I don't think they sell that anymore. But we would, she would spray all the baseboards, and especially under the sink and around the kitchen where we were preparing food and everything. Okay. Um, so what that's about is what we call uh, the thyroid power step nine. How you can improve the real situation. The real cause of low thyroid is the immune system. Okay. Improve the underlying autoimmune condition. Autoimmune conditions are mysterious, and just why they occur is partly genetic, partly environmental. You can't do much about your genetics except to choose your ancestors more carefully, you know. <laughs> but you can, uh, and you learn that for your next life. 
okay? Right. But for right now, you can do uh, the, the environment, okay? So try to keep your environment really as clean as possible. It, it, it's worth going to the health food store to get organic. I, that's like, it's, I know it's extra money, but it's worth, okay. Uh, there are multiple triggers, not just one thing, but uh, you could go and, and get really, you know, uh, you know, clean water, but uh, wrap the cheese, the organic cheese, in cling wrap. And the cling wrap has the plasticizers. Don't, you know, you know about that? Why? Uh, saran wrap has plasticizers that can mess you up, but, but uh, polypropylene, GLAD polypropylene wrap uh, does not. And it's just as clear. And I don't work for the company. That's okay. The, um, so uh, a lot of, you, you, you probably had, I have a feeling there have been health medicine forums dedicated to some of this topic, uh, but it's really important for the thyroid. And the, 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 the item, Our Stolen Future, really uh, brings that home wonderfully. Demonsky and Myers, Our Stolen Future. Okay, next step, the last step. We're finally there, this is the last step. Okay, uh, you get to have other people helping you in this. Get a team together. The team at, like, at the Health Medicine uh, Institute with not, an MD, but also you have a nutritionist and also uh, maybe a psychologist, also the, someone who's a, a body, anyway, you get to have a team and also other people. You can have a thyroid support group that, uh, that works very useful. Here's the actual step. People in your support group could help you with uh, hints about how they had better physical comfort, what the journey is like and, uh, when you're between when you're first diagnosed and you're scared and you don't have a doctor that uh, will listen to you and what you can do after that. What are all the things you can do about autoimmunity, uh, which uh, is oddly enough related to uh, self-expression and self-esteem. Now how could autoimmunity be related to self-expression and self-esteem? Has that been proven in the research, Alex? No, <laughs> right. there is research about this. I did a course called Mind Body Immunity, and uh, that'll be next month at the Health Medicine Forum. I'll present. <laughs> no, no, that's a joke. Uh, but I, at the university level, uh, we presented uh, this uh, to uh, nursing students, and they were uh, fascinated by just how much research is available about this. So you improve your health, your thyroid by improving uh, your overall sense of uh, of life, uh, getting. Um, feeling more comfortable about uh, your past behaviors and being kinder to yourself. All, all of this, uh, how, what, a lot of you women there who have the thyroid problem, the, the feelings, uh, negative feelings that you may have about your mother, they may be, uh, uh, especially if she had thyroid herself, you have a double whammy. You have the genetic problem and the, the environment problem and how she treated you. But how you feel about all of that uh, is affecting your own immune system and how it's attacking your own thyroid right now. So you could be angry at your mother, but uh, she's right inside, right here, right in the fifth chakra, okay? All right. Uh, we've tried to develop a new paradigm. Lynn has told you about a new paradigm that he's uh, very proud of, and I, I am, again, insisting that you, you check it out because it's, it's, a wonderful, it's a wonderful thing, this multidisciplinary clinic. Here's a new paradigm that I am developing. Okay, it turns out that there's so many horror stories that I've uh, come up against with uh, people that come to book signings that I've done in different parts of the country or that call in on radio shows when I'm just talking about this thyroid book and they say, yeah, this is all great stuff, but I have a doctor who won't listen to a thing I say, who says, no, your, your, your thyroid is normal, your TSH is normal, you're normal, I don't care about any of the other stuff that you're showing me, I don't care about that book, I don't, okay. So, what to do? There's a lot that can be done. I know how to talk to doctors. I have a whole section in this book called Show This to Your Doctor, where I very carefully selected just the right research studies that would turn the heads of even the worst stick in the mud. Okay? And I've said it in medical leaves in a way that's kind of hard to say, oh, you're just a, a you know, complaining lady. Have you ever been told you're a complaining lady? Uh, that you're just, okay, right, oh, never. never, okay. <laughs> the doctors will sometimes treat their women patients as if they're just old complaining ladies and, and uh, you know, you, you, okay. And there's a way, around, there's a lot of ways around that. I do coaching. So on, on some of the numbers that you have there, if you or someone that you know is, is having a problem with their doctor, the solution is to get another doctor on your side 
who really knows how to get this to happen. Okay, what? Get the right tests, get the right medicines, get a clinical trial when it's needed, try something different when it's needed, add some alternative therapies when it's needed, et cetera, et cetera. And it's been years and years of figuring out how to do that, and I have a few tips on it. So I coach people all over the country, and they report back that it's been very useful. I have a database of thyroid-friendly doctors all over the country. I'm not the only one doing this. There are a lot of other doctors who are doing it. Some of them are writing books, others are not writing books, they're just quietly in their community doing all of the things that uh, Lynn would be happy that they're doing. They're like Alex Foreman. He's there in his office and he's doing it every day, okay? And I have lists of them with their phone numbers. So I tell people about that. When I find out what it is that they need, do they need a GP, do they really need an, uh, an endocrinologist, etc. So, thyroid coaching, let me see. My wife's out of town, but she's the one who insisted that I, <laughs> that I tell you about this. She made these slides, and she said, you show those slides! <laughs> her name is Carolee, and a lot of uh, her story, her personal thyroid story, is in the book. And the reason that is, it's a very important reason, is that she wrote the book. Okay, she was... <laughs> Carolee is the writer in the family. I'm the doctor. She, uh, she wrote a lot of the book. And it's about her. It's about autoimmune thyroid. It's about having trouble with an endocrinologist who says you're fine at 50% of your true self. Or that's as good as it can get. Or your tests are normal. So we have a website that you might want to check out. Uh, and then that's the 800, uh, that's the toll-free number. So all in all, what this thyroid power thing is about is that the boulder doesn't have to be on top of you. You can be on top of it. And there's a lot of steps and ways to do that. So, right at the moment, we'll put on the lights. And I'd like to uh, thank you for, attention, uh, for your attention about those slides. We are going to take a brief intermission. And during that time, you get to be as thyroid uh, healing, uh, do whatever thyroid healing activities are going to be appropriate for you. Some of you may want to get the Thyroid Power book, although it's available at Amazon, it's available at, at bookstores. If you want to get it here, I have brought a few copies, and uh, so I will uh, be over at this table. If you have any questions of a very personal nature, you may want to ask Alex Foreman. If you need to borrow any money, then Lynn Saputo is right here. <laughs> And then, and then in, a, in about, would we say five minutes, Lynn? Would you, uh, ten minutes? Uh, Let's see what it's Yeah, in about ten minutes, we will, uh, any of you uh, that, that would have any questions, okay? I mean, real questions about yourself, your loved ones, that you want, that you've, everything you've always wanted to ask your doctor about uh, thyroid, you know, but we're afraid to, or couldn't get him to listen, or her to listen. We'll, uh, Alex and I will be doing that together, okay? Time to stretch. All right. What a nice way to humanize this whole subject. It gets so complicated. So stick around because we're going to have questions at this microphone in about 10 minutes. Here, can people in the back? Can you hear? Okay, so uh, speak. speak uh, Turn me up, Mike. Speak, speak right into the microphone. And yes, sir. Up. Okay. okay, you can hear me now in the back row. Good. I take Lavoxol 0 0.05, taken it for about two, two and a half months, and it's not really making me feel any different. And so my idea is maybe I should take one and a half or two tablets instead of one. What um, do you think about that? Once again, how much Lavoxyl? I take 1.05 a day. Now, let's see when I do this. Okay. Now, 1.5. Zero. Zero. 1.0. Okay, now, Lavoxyl comes as 0 0.025, 0 0.025, 0 0.025, 0 0.025, 0 0.025, 0 0.025, 0 0.025, 0 0.025, 0 0.025, 0 0.025, 0 0.025, 0 0.025, 0 0.025, 0 0.025
0 0.05, It doesn't come in the dose that you're describing. Say your dose again. But she's saying a single 0 0.05. 0 0.05. Okay, I'm sorry. One pill of 0 0.05. <laughs> I was the last one in the room to get that. All right. <laughs> okay. Let's you and I look this way. Okay. That's the candid camera there. <laughs> All right. I just want you to know that 0 0.05 is a very small dose. Okay. Generally, the university doctors, the university thyroid specialists would start people off, the, the, the rule of thumb would be, not that you would start with this much, but the rule of thumb would be, the standard dose for you would be one microgram per pound of body weight. Now, you don't have to tell me your weight, but I just want you to know, you're taking enough with basically 0.05 milligrams is really 50 micrograms. And you're taking enough for a 50 pound person. I weigh, 100, I weigh 120. Okay, now another dose could be 112 or 125, okay? Same medicine, but a 0.125 or a 0.112. The, the 125 micrograms is the same as the 0.125 milligrams, okay? Same, same dose, same uh, thing. You might be under-medicated, and your thought of taking uh, maybe one and a half of those as a first, to, to see if I'm, I'm taking enough, that might be, make sense because you're taking a very small size pill. But a person who's taking 125 and is not getting enough says, well, I'll take one and a half of these. Alex, how much would that be? About 187. Okay. He's quick, isn't he? I didn't think. <laughs> All right. 187 would be a big jump. Then now you're getting into higher levels. So for you to take one and a half of your pills, which you had asked me before, could I take one and a half? and see if that was better. You could, although please keep it a secret. I know I'm on video and you're listening. But please keep it a secret that I would ever at say that it's okay to adjust your medicine yourself. It's best to, to do this with someone's permission and ideas and understanding, okay? But you're on a very small dose. Your hands are cold. When I shook your hand over there, it was cold. You're telling me that your symptoms are now getting worse. Your eyes are getting dry. A suboptimal dose works for a while and then it starts to fade out on you. And then you might need more, especially if you're one microgram per pound, you're like a half or a third of what might be a normal dose for you. You do get to try a little more. I thank you for the question. Okay. I was hoping you'd ask that. <laughs> The question was, and I'm going to turn this over to Alex, the question was, in a situation like this, why not add the Cytomel? Alex, what do you think? Okay, well, a couple, um, a couple of things I want to make clear. Um, this thing work? <laughs> okay, a couple of things I, I would want people to understand. You should be aware of the symptoms of hyperthyroidism if you start monkeying around with your own dose. Because theoretically, even bumping yourself from 50 micrograms to 75, in fact, one of the people who came up to me during the break said that at 75, she was already feeling kind of jumpy, jittery, having problems sleeping, which means she's probably maxed out on what her body at this time can handle. So symptoms of hyperthyroidism are things like feeling jumpy, jittery, like you drink, feeling like you drank a whole lot of coffee, unpleasantly stimulated, anything that indicates your body's going too fast, rapid or irregular heartbeats, diarrhea, extra sweating, insomnia. So in other words, if you flip from being kind of lethargic and tired to suddenly being too sped up, that means you've probably d gone over the limit of how much, at this particular time, how much thyroid your body can handle. To just add Cytomel by yourself, well, first of all, you'd have to get it by prescription, but Cytomel is fine, but again, it's more likely, theoretically at least, to cause the hyperthyroid symptoms to come out. If you're close to the limit and you add Cytomel, 
without any guidance or supervision, I think there's a, a little more risk there, particularly if you're susceptible to heart palpitations. Cytomel, because it's pure T3, goes right to work, it could overstimulate you. Not that you shouldn't try it, you should try it, but I mean, I, it's one case where I think you should have some supervision or guidance and just don't go out on your own and take your friend's Cytomel and start downing pills, which some people do. I've seen people come in and say, oh yeah, I took 15 of these Cytomels. <laughs> And they're okay, but I'm sort of like, oh, you did? Wow. <laughs> you know? And some people can handle that many, but some people can't. So I think I, I don't want either of us giving the notion that as much as both of us really are into empowerment, and I know that, I mean, one of the groups I used to work with was medical self-care, and our whole philosophy was that just turn it over to people, you know, minimize the amount that doctors and providers have to do. And there's a point for that, but there's a point where it becomes dangerous. So I just don't want anyone getting hurt because, you know, we, we are saying most people need to increase their dose, but don't just do it blindly. I, I have two questions. Um, one, can you differentiate between Hashimoto's as a type of autoimmune disease, and are you saying that all hypothyroid conditions are autoimmune? That's my first question. And the second question... Let me answer that question first. Okay. Do I look like I would say that all thyroid problems are Hashimoto's, right? No, 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 all right. Most low thyroid is Hashimoto's. Most all low thyroid is autoimmune. The run-of-the-mill regular low thyroid. Most of it is the autoimmune type, okay? Far and away. And that the, the name for the autoimmune is called Hashimoto's in honor of Dr. Hashimoto. You've heard of Ryotoro Hashimoto. Okay, that's not the guy. <laughs> that was the prime minister of Japan back in the, in, the, in the late 90s. But a possible relative of his, I don't know if it's a relative. Do you know, who knows if Hashimoto the doctor was a relative of Hashimoto the prime minister? <laughs> But this was many, many years before Ryotoro became prime minister. There was a doctor, Hashimoto, who gave the world this wonderful gift that there's thyroid problems caused by the immune system. And he thought, and all the other doctors thought it was just one little piece of it. But it now, it turns out most low thyroid and all of the high thyroid, Graves' disease, hyperthyroidism, that's autoimmune. Second part of your question. That's for Alex now. I would just like a further elaboration of how a whiplash injury can trigger a thyroid problem, probably hypothyroid. Are you thinking it goes through the adrenal axis or is it hit straight, uh, straight to the thyroid? I just had a whiplash injury. You should take that one. Okay. Okay, the question is, does a whiplash injury, could it trigger thyroid problem? The answer is yes, but then the, the question that was actually asked was, well, how does that happen? Nobody knows, <laughs> but... I could have said that. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it's believed, no, it's believed that it does, no, it does happen. And it's a, a, an injury, okay? The thyroid is very exposed. And if you are prone to uh, this autoimmune thing, an injury will trigger it. Th this business of a, a going back and forth, there's a nerve that uh, could be injured that goes into the thyroid. Chiropractor was telling me about uh, subluxation of uh, the, the cervical vertebrae uh, in the whiplash, then injuring the nerve that goes to the thyroid. I didn't know anything about a nerve that goes to the, the medical doctors aren't trained in that. Okay. There are a variety of other uh, reasons. You, just any injury can put a great deal of stress and strain on the adrenal and uh, other organs, and then you would have, normally have enough thyroid for normal general operating principles. But when you get this injury, especially something that's now, uh, this uh, a whiplash is, uh, is a devastating kind of injury for a variety of reasons. Everything that's up here that connects to everything that's down here, it goes right through here. Okay, and that's where the thyroid is. Anyway, everybody follow that? <laughs> <laughs> Next question, please. Okay, nutrition. What are foods that are beneficial and what are foods that are damaging or not beneficial? And I want to go sit down so I can write. 
Oh, sorry. Okay. All right. The, uh, Alex did the research on the book, and I uh, would, uh, turned it over to Carolee, and Carolee wrote it. So neither of us know the answer to that. <laughs> <laughs> because we forgot. But, no, I, honestly, honestly. I told you about soy, okay? It, it turns out that, let's start with the things that are good for the thyroid. A natural foods diet that's low in chemicals fairly high in protein, but uh, not very high in uh, simple carbohydrates, but, but uh, rich in complex carbohydrates, a nutrient-rich diet that has very uh, few in the way of additives or you know, chemical uh, contaminants. That's what's best for the thyroid. A lot of fruits and vegetables, not very much in the way of dairy products. Dairy products are sensitizing. Wheat is believed to uh, be a trigger for uh, thyroid. We all eat wheat every day, try to eat less of it. Turns out gluten sensitivity and Hashimoto's thyroiditis are like that. They're in bed together. And if a person has a gluten sensitivity, they ought to treat the thyroid. A lot of people with thyroid ought not to be eating so much wheat. So in general, it's the diet intake that we know is good for us, that we don't really always follow, that's what's good, good for thyroid. What are things to avoid? There's a long list of goitrogens. Everything from uh, tapioca to pine nuts can be mildly goitrogenic. The most common ones are the cruciferous vegetables that every other doctor has told you are good to eat and good for the prevention of every other illness. If all of these things are cooked well, oh, the cruciferous vegetables are the broccoli, Brussels sprouts, uh, the, the cabbage, cauliflower, kale, the, the brassica uh, family, okay. It turns out that if you cook these really well, that helps reduce the goitrogens. And the people that are really at risk for that goitrogen problem are the people that are not getting enough iodine or the people that are already on thyroid medicines that are not getting uh, enough of their thyroid medicine. All right? Iodine is a double-edged sword. You've heard the old saw about, oh, you have a thyroid problem, here's the kelp pills. Right. Don't do it. That's for people who are in areas where there is iodine that is not added to their bread dough or to their table salt, or they don't eat any fish, and they certainly don't have a sushi uh, every uh, month or two, okay? If you do those things, you're not gonna be low in iodine for the, for the most part. Iodine deficiency exists worldwide, is one of the number one health problems on the planet. Everything from retardation, uh, to just the, the, the enormous numbers of miscarriage, all kinds of illnesses from iodine deficiency. But in this country, we've really overdone it in terms of countering iodine deficiency. And it's mostly we have, for a lot of people, too much iodine. So the kelp tablets, buy them and send them to Asia. <laughs> Okay, or South America. Most of South America is, uh, is the interior of South America, the interior of Africa, the interior of the continents. And the interior of North America was that goiter belt kind of area, but that's now, that's now been changed. Now there are people that are saying, and Norman Sheely, the great uh, doctor who founded the American Holistic Medical Association, is saying that all of what I've told you was true up until about four or five years ago. <laughs> And now it's changing back. Now the pendulum is beginning to swing back. And that there are some people who might be iodine deficient. Too much iodine or too little iodine is troublesome for the thyroid. <coughs> if you eat any of the stuff that I mentioned, you're probably not one of those people who are iodine deficient. And if you have a tendency, family history of any of this autoimmune, and you start eating these kelp tablets, you're gonna trigger your Hashimoto's into a flare up or into, you know, it can be normal under control. You don't have a thyroid problem. You just have an aunt who had a thyroid uh, condition. You don't. And then you start eating kelp tablets because you think they're good for you. You can trigger yourself into it. That happened to my wife. So the biggest food problem is, uh, is iodine. The biggest, 
artificial additive is fluoride. If you're in a town that fluoridates its water, Lynn, do you know if this town fluoridates its water? How about Lafayette? Okay. John Lee, who was here on this very podium uh, a couple of weeks ago, I guess, uh, uh, I mean a, a month or two ago, uh, we talked about this a lot. He's seen people go in and out of their thyroid problem depending on if they're in a, a, a fluoridated area or not. Try to, if you're in a fluoridated uh, a water area, try to get the fluoride out of your water and you need a reverse osmosis unit or a distiller to do it. The carbon block filters don't do that. They take, they take get rid of a lot of other things that you need to get rid of, but fluoride, you need reverse osmosis or a distiller, okay? In the back of the room? Oh, good. Is that a reverse osmosis unit I see back there? That's a water ionizer that separates out the fluoride. That separates out the, okay, so an ionizer that separates out the fluoride. It's a very good idea, okay? Pardon. Um, let me just add a couple of things. In terms of if you're on thyroid, what you shouldn't do, one is um, yes, hello? shouldn't take calcium at the same time that you're taking your thyroid pills because calcium will block the absorption of the thyroid. It's okay to be on calcium, but if you usually you take thyroid first thing in the morning, you should take your calcium at night. And the other one that'll do that is iron. So if you're taking iron supplements, don't take them at the same moment that you take your thyroid medication. It won't do anything bad, it'll just limit the absorption. <laughs> you wanna go ahead and maybe I can answer it. Too. Well, pick one. <laughs> well, I am curious also, just impersonally, what you think of um, Dennis Wilson's book on the Wilson Syndrome and if you find any value in that. Uh, for myself, um, I was one of the people who was given uh, massive doses of kelp pills back in 1979, and by 81, I grew a uh, nodule on my thyroid. And um, I realized that I was probably iodine sensitive, but I don't know how to figure any of that out. I come from Minnesota, which is a goiter belt, and uh, it was too much iodine for me to handle, and I learned at the time that it's safe, safer not to go above 144 micrograms a day. But, you know, I learned that after the fact. And I don't know what the relationship is to a nodule and getting Hashimoto's uh, some 20 years later, but I, I, was, I had the automobile accident, the trauma that could have pushed me over the brink. What I'm curious about is whether or not um, in this form of autoimmunity, there's any vacillating between a low thyroid situation and a hyper situation like in a brittle diabetic where you'll get too much sugar and then too little. And I'm wondering if that is at all uh, something that you've observed. Because my own history is that I got insomnia after my mercury fillings at age 12. Horrible insomnia. And there was someone at Berkeley who wrote a thesis on the relationship between mercury fillings, candida, which I got very badly then, and low thyroid. And I just wondered if my insomnia I mean, my insomnia doesn't go along with all the symptoms of hyperthyroidism. It goes along rather with hypo. But I do have it, and then I do have a problem in balancing myself. I can have to whip myself to get into activity, then it's harder to come down. Okay. Um, your, first, your, your first question was um, on Wilson syndrome, and I think we have not seen great results with people that have tried the Wilson's protocol, which basically involves taking increasing doses of pure T3 cytomel, basically to the point where you actually develop the side effects of it, and then backing down from that, and then supposedly after, after you back down, you won't need to take thyroid ever again, but your thyroid's now been cured. I have not seen that happen in people, we've had people come in and try it, and I have not been impressed um, at all. I, I could not recommend that protocol. Um, there are people that have both Hashimoto's hypothyroidism and then develop um, a hyperthyroidism. But they stay one or the other. No, no, there's people that have, can have both at once. Yeah, it's, a, I was wondering. it's not a large group, but there are people that have both. And sometimes they have to take both medicines to slow down the thyroid, like tapazol, plus Synthroid to stimulate. So that's a complicated case. Um, but, but you've had some experience seeing them more than I have. But. That it can happen. Does happen. And it's not, have, it's not the most common thing. Yes. Have you worked a lot with heavy metal detox? Because my merc the mercury fillings is what started all of it when I was 12. 
The mercury will be toxic for the thyroid, okay? And it's a problem, and the candida is involved. It, it, it makes for a very complex uh, autoimmune situation. But the, the simple uh, answer to your question about uh, insomnia, low thyroid can cause people to be in, insomnic. And then you get treated, and then you're, you can be better. If your thyroid goes high, high thyroid can cause insomnia. And you treat that, and then it comes down, and you can be better. So both low or high can cause insomnia. The resolution of the high or low can then lead to resolution of the insomnia. So they're very much related. And each of these is layers. This paradigm that I showed you with these slides, is that, that, that there are many layers to this. And you, work on, you should work on one layer at a time. Come back and talk to us right after, because your situation is complex. And any of you that have a complex situation, what we're telling you, one layer at a time. And the thyroid, getting, optimizing the thyroid is sometimes, that's a useful first layer, because it provides the foundation for the, for the others. That's a mixed metaphor, though. <laughs> Thank you for your book. Many of what you um, wrote about that book, I began to realize that many of the problems I was experiencing, you had very clearly stated, like hoarseness, and I have some neuropathy in my feet, and just things that other doctors were really not able to help me with much. Um, my question is, is this treated as sort of an alternative approach and insurance does not cover this, or is this something that the tests and treatments would be covered by insurance? Um, most insurance companies will cover uh, the basic thyroid tests. Uh, if you're part of an HMO like um, Kaiser or something, they usually won't order all these tests, depending on the doctor. There's some individual practitioners at Kaiser that are totally into this and will do it. There's some practitioners at Kaiser that if you ask them, I want this test, they'll do it. There's some that won't. But this is not considered alternative therapies in the no. way that um, like acupuncture or something might be considered by some insurance company. This is pretty straight workup of someone, all you have to do is list the symptoms, fatigue, um, memory loss, weight gain, and you totally have a legitimate reason to check that person's thyroid. So you no, know, you don't have to worry about it. You also mentioned in the book something called, um, that's organic, called Nature Thyroid. Your comments on that. And also, um, I received in the mail, because I'm on the list now, for comments about indium and the effect of that on the thyroid, which is supposed to be very positive and evidently a, a missing trace element that we lack in our food resources. Any comments or anything? Talk about nature thyroid and uh, the, what we have at our clinic is, is different, yeah. Yeah, uh, nature thyroid is one of the forms of natural thyroid. There's several brands, I mean, there's Armour is the main brand, there's West Thyroid, there's nature thyroid, there's bio thyroid. And it really doesn't make rational sense, but it seems that some of these different thyroid formulations have different effects. In general, I've found nature thyroid to be, have a little more kick to it than the other thyroids. Part of that might be a dosing thing. They have 65 milligrams in their one grain tablet, while the others all have 60. It also might be a batching problem because these thyroids are produced in batches and then for, so sometimes you get a bad batch or a weak batch. But in general, I would say nature thyroid is probably a little more powerful than armor. Biothroid tends to be a little less powerful, a little more gentle and smoother. So someone who, who's very sensitive to the T3 component, I would tend to put them on biothroid because it's less likely to provoke a hyperthyroid symptom than either nature thyroid or armor. The indium, I don't know a lot about it. I did have one patient who swore that it um, really helped her a lot. And I tried to look it up. I couldn't find much about it. But this is a whole book. Yeah, I didn't see that book. <laughs> but anyway, yeah, that's, I don't know much, but I, she swore that it really helped her more than almost any of them. We're going to have to limit to one question each because it's 9.30 and I want everybody to get a chance to finish. Hi, I'm a chiropractor, so I'm, I'm a night prescribing doctor. I have a patient who uh, was put on levothyroid about 10 years ago. She's been on about 100 pounds. So your comments, please. Patient who, patient who is put on levothyroid and then is probably me measured by lab tests, oh, this is the right amount of levothyroid according to your test, and then the patient is gradually gaining weight, okay? The levothyroid is not what this patient needs. 
and it may show up on the blood test that was used, maybe the TSH, to be putting the TSH into the proper range. But levothyroid is not what this patient needs. The patient is gaining weight. The patient is more hypothyroid. Maybe it's helped one symptom but made something else worse. It doesn't sound like it's been the right thing. So instead, the patient can get put on levothyroid plus cytomel or switch to armor or natrothroid or we have in our clinic. What the ours is uh, biothroid. Is it, but this levothroid alone, levothroid alone is not working. It's, it, it's not right. What could be the reason? The patient might do best to get a test called a reverse T3. A reverse T3 is for people who are on T4 and are not getting, or thi um, this thyroxine, synthroid, levothroid, levoxyl, the unithroid are forms of uh, thyroxine. And thyroxine in some people gets converted to reverse T3 which as much as T3, the good stuff, is the gas pedal, vroom, 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 you know? Reverse T3 is the brake. And you screech to a halt. Things are worse. Do you see that diagram that had all the spaghetti on it? That, that was reverse T3, you know? You didn't remember. Check the patients, have them check the patients reverse T3 to see if it's high. Or check total T3 or free T3 to see if that's not really as high as they think it is. Something is wrong. You do, and, you, and I hear this when someone comes in, it's been, oh, I've been on this medicine and it's been making me feel terrible for 17 years now. <laughs> wow. What, why, you know, if it's not working really well, ditch it and do something else. Uh, the, the other thing, I, I, people should realize thyroid is not a magic weight loss pill. If it was, we wouldn't even have to be here. Um, <laughs> So it's not like you just take thyroid and the pounds are going to drop off you. It, that's just not the way it works. I mean, if you're really hypothyroid, severely, and you give somebody that, they will lose some weight. But most of the people we see, if you, if you give them thyroid, it's not like the pounds start falling off them. It'll often stop people from gaining as much. So there might be another reason why this person's gained 100 pounds. It might not, they might, you know, it might be another reason. It might be another reason. Also. Uh, even though it's not the magic bullet for, for weight loss, there are a great many people that we've seen at our clinic and that uh, we've each seen over the years, is that once your thyroid is normalized, the items uh, the, on the list that you would do that are helpful for weight loss will start to work. When they hadn't worked before, now they can start to work. Um, is there any relationship between thyroid condition and hypoglycemia? Because I know you mentioned diabetes. Oh, oh big time. Sure. That. Yeah, that's, that's really um, a big one because a lot of people who have dietary restrictions have already built into their life and one of them would be hypoglycemic, um, food allergies, food intolerances. It's incredible that some of these people, when you put them on thyroid, suddenly they can eat everything. I've had people come in and say, God, before I did this, I could, I, my diet was so limited. And now they're out eating things that they just, whatever they want. And it doesn't bother them anymore. And that's not everyone, but I have seen that a number of times. And I think it's, as, um, as Richard was saying, the thyroid's kind of the, the gas pedal for everything. And if it's off, your ability to handle different kinds of food is really diminished. If you get that basic pump working, your body can handle sugars, carbohydrates, much better. So is there any special things that a person who is both of those should do, or just the normal thyroid treatment? Get your thyroid Get your thyroid balanced, and you'll find you should be less hypoglycemic than you are. Thank you. I'm curious um, about the differential diagnosis with chronic fatigue syndrome. How do you tell the difference when somebody walks in and which of those they might have with low thyroid? Well, thank you for that question. But we're out of time. Uh, Lynn, uh, I'm sorry to have taken... Okay, wait. Okay. <laughs> we're laughing. Out of those of you who don't understand why we're laughing is that that's a loaded question. Okay. <laughs> Thyroid and thyroid treatment is on every chronic fatigue or fibromyalgia expert's protocol. Okay? It is part of the uh, treatment uh, uh, for it. It is part of the differential diagnosis. Many people are told that they have chronic fatigue, fibromyalgia, actually have low thyroid, causing the whole thing. 
But some people have chronic fatigue and fibromyalgia. But like I showed you on step two, they also have low thyroid and it's making it worse. They have chronic fatigue fibromyalgia, which is an immune system uh, illness. It's a very specific and uh, difficult to diagnose, difficult to treat immune system illness, brain stem, uh, hypothalamus. What is it? Where is it? Where is the lesion? It, uh, you know, anyway, we can go into that. But, uh, and transfer factor helps in a lot of other things. Okay, but, but it's a very complex condition. But if you have low thyroid along with it, it really helps to treat the low thyroid. And if you have low thyroid along with it and you don't treat the low thyroid, you never get any headway in treating the chronic fatigue fibromyalgia. How can you tell when someone comes in which they have? Well, the symptoms are pretty much the same, the complaints are pretty much the same, uh, everything, okay. I'll answer your question. You must be a university professor, all right? All right here you go. If the reflex, if the ankle reflex is sluggish, that's usually a good indicator that it's thyroid and not high, uh, chronic fatigue syndrome. If the person is chilly rather than too warm, that's another indicator. If the person has n not a, a tenderness of the, uh, the thyroid gl uh, gland area, but instead tender lymph nodes, and you look back and there's actual inflammation of the throat, that's usually chronic fatigue fibromyalgia while the tenderness of the thyroid gland in the throat's fine, that's usually thyroid. So the, the, there's, a, there's a few differences, and, but the, both co the conditions really coexist. It is quite, uh, you ever tease hair apart? And you, uh, you know, okay, it's like that. Hi. Um, okay. um, I'm interested in the relationship between the thyroid levels the body needs and the metabolic functioning related to, you know, how am I trying to say this, exercise. If a person exercises more, does it change the thyroid dosage? Or if a person starts to function better and they use their, their larger muscles and their metabolism better, does that ever change the dosage? Yeah, I, I think it's definitely possible that if you get your body into better shape, whatever, we mean by that, but generally cardiovascular, particularly muscle metabolism, that you could uh, lower your thyroid dose. Because in a sense, you're feeding the body with energy through another pathway. And part of the thyroid deficiency might be made up by that. And I, somebody asked, can you ever get off thyroid? Absolutely, depending on why you were put on it first. But I've taken people off thyroid who've been on it for 10 or 15 years. And there's kind of a myth going around in the community that once you're on thyroid, that's it. It, it wipes your thyroid out. If you, people come in saying, well, I don't want to take Synthroid because if I take that, then my thyroid's dead. It's not true. We've gotten people off thyroid who've been on it for a really long time. But some people can't get off it because when you try to drop them down, they'll hit a point where they go, now I remember why I went on thyroid. I don't like feeling this way. I say, well, you don't have to. But yeah, you could... Um, definitely alter the dose of thyroid as your condition in life changes. Yeah, because um, I don't have a thyroid gland because I had it removed when I was quite young due to cancer. But I noticed that when I change my physical activity levels that I feel differences. And so I've always wondered about that. Well, yeah, and I think you're onto something. You're onto it. Listen. Uh, th thank you folks very, very much. Uh, th all the uh, other questions, Lynn Saputo will answer. <laughs> Alex, no, I just got a page, as you saw, and I, I have to leave. Um, so Lynn will uh, uh, either... <laughs> and if he says, I'm sorry, we're out of time, that means he's just the being afraid to answer the questions. Okay. But uh, Alex and I will have to leave right after. Folks, it has been a wonderful pleasure. Lynn, I shake your hand. This has been terrific. We've run over pretty well and you're all still here. That says a lot. Yeah. One of the things that I really think is so important has been reflected through the evening over and over and over again. And that's that we're looking to be artists at what we do. You can't read a textbook and be a doctor or a healthcare practitioner by itself. Being with people and trying to understand what their situation is and putting it into a perspective is the key to any good health practitioner's situation with the patient. It's the relationship that's so important. And that's what, in large part, they're talking about. 
So it's that connection, that deep caring, that makes the big difference about whether or not a treatment will be successful or not. When we try to treat diseases instead of people, we get astray. So the art of medicine, I think, is not lost. Hooray. Hooray is right. <laughs> so I want to thank Richard again for making this event possible. And I'd like to remind you that we have a, a couple of announcements to make. One is that we, our next meeting is going to be on Native American shamanism. And we're going to have Philip Scott, who is, a, who is a member of the Institute, be part of this presentation, as well as some people from different areas of, of uh, Indian medicine participate. And we also have an event that's called Beyond Wellness that we're going to be, ha we're going to be handling in Walnut Creek at the Regional Center for the Arts. And there are going to be three events, one on the 7th, the 14th, and the 21st of October. The first one being how to cut through the confusion of nutrition. The second one will look at women's health issues. And the third one at how to manage pain. So if you're interested in this event, which I'll, I'll moderate myself, along with the staff from the Institute, uh, you can either call 943-SHOW, where you can get a ticket, or you can call us at the Institute, and we'll be happy to help you. So, but thank everybody for coming. We'll see you next month. Have a good evening. <laughs>